Okay, uh, well, everybody, I'm sorry there isn't time to ask you to introduce yourselves. I'd be very interested to know who you are and what your roles and interests are, but perhaps that can come up uh, as we go along and in question time at the end. As, as I was introduced, I'm a professor of management learning at Lancaster University and various other things, and learning organization has been one of my interests uh, um, way back to around 1990 when the whole thing kicked off, particularly with Peter Senge's um, famous book, The Fifth Discipline. Um, <clears throat> as I say here, I'm not sure whether this will work, but if you've got any questions, you go along, email me on this email address on the current slide, and I'll um, <clears throat> try and respond to it according, which uh, and I may not at all, so don't be insulted. Hopefully, if I don't, we will pick it up eventually. Um, <clears throat> what I hope you will learn from this is, is what a learning organization is, at least according to me and my colleagues, <clears throat> what the benefits are of being one, how to take initiatives to achieve it, um, and for you, how to take this, this forward, and there are a number of possibilities for that which will come up later. Um, so here's my agenda, what the organization is, what the advantages are, how it works, there's some case examples which I may or may not go into, but I can mention what they are, um, and you, we can pick those up possibly in question time. Um, how to, uh, <coughs> di to, to guard, diagnose the um, degree to which, um, sorry, my phone's ringing, I'll just turn that off. Um, as I said, I'll uh, mention some case examples. I'll, I'll talk about how to diagnose the degree to which an organization that you're working in and all four is a learning organization uh, and uh, how to plan initiatives to become more of one on the basis of that. How to take this further, some resources um, that will be available to you and then hopefully we'll get through to our, um, our discussion. So um, here's the definition that me and my colleagues work with. A learning organization is an organization that develops itself and its context in a process uh, reciprocally linked to the development of its members and stakeholders. That's a bit of a mouthful, so obviously it develops itself, but sometimes organizations develop their context. So for example, an organization in the middle of a supply chain may influence organizations up and down the supply chain. There are many other examples. Um, um, and this is reciprocally linked to its own members, people who work for it, and other stakeholders. We'll, there'll be more about this as we go along. <coughs> Here's our main book, The Learning Company. The first edition was 1996. The second one is, uh, sorry, the first one was 1990 or 91, uh, the second one, 96, it's available, it's published by McGraw Hill, as you'll see. It's, I think it costs about at 20 pounds, English money, available from Amazon, probably the cheapest way for you to get it, but I can provide it, um, but it, it and probably costs more because of the postage involved, um, and I have various other resources. We actually call it the word learning company, I just want to explain our use of the word company. <coughs> um, we use it partly to differentiate it from learning organization, but we use it in its original sense. Sorry if I'm speaking too fast, I'll try to slow down a bit. Uh, it literally comes from the word compane, probably the Latin breaking bread together, eating together. So it means uh, people working together. Um, and we certainly see the idea, and we know it is, as relevant to the public sector and third sector, that's charities and so on as well as the private sector, where, where the term limited liability company, at least in the UK, um, is, is, um, is a common meaning and association. Um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a definition. Here's an odd way of thinking about it. If you look at this um, two by two, the dimensions are uh, <clears throat> whether an organization um, gets advantage from being a learning organization, and it's not as though you're in any one of these boxes, they're more scales, and the extent to which um, an organization is can, um, consciously planned to be so, or just does it, um, or it happens anyway. Uh, so, uh, B would be organizations, plan to be in organizations and get the advantage from it. 
A would be um, organisations that don't. So, for example, in this country, Unilever, which is a very famous firm and has survived as such for many years, uh, is presumably a learning organisation, but as, as far as I know, they haven't deliberately done so. Um, Boots, the chemists um, in this country, <coughs> their HR director told me that they, behind the scenes they plan to be one, but they don't come out uh, and say that in public because they think that that the word sounds too soft um, and would affect their stock market ratings. Um, it, it, it's inclined to be seen as a soft, or it can be seen as a soft concept, but it's not, as, as hopefully we'll see later. See are those organisations that aren't trying to be and don't get advantage from it, though presumably if they survive at all, they are managing to be so, at least at some minimal level. And they are those who have, have taken the initiatives and they haven't worked, perhaps they haven't left it long enough, and and so on. So I hope that helps you think about um, <clears throat> what it is, and indeed any organisation uh, that you work in or for where it's, it's up to. Um, there are a number of benefits, um, surviving and thriving in the changing world, as I've um, already suggested. Consistently meeting targets for all stakeholders, so that would obviously include um, profit return on investment or in the public sector and perhaps charities meeting targets, whatever they may be, um, but also in a sustainable way, in the title, subtitle of our book, in other words, consistency over over time, and thirdly and lastly for now, <coughs> climbing Peter Senge's uh, ladder, and that, that is from reactive to adaptive to generative. Reactive is um, the idea of it ain't broke, don't fix it, uh, which can work, but often the damage is too serious if you leave it to that stage. Adaptive, which is probably where 90-95% of organisations are, uh, and that's true of the strategy literature as well and practice that read, uh, that read coming changes in the environment and position themselves to at least survive them and hopefully take advantage of them. Uh, the generative organisation are, are ones that more change the environment to suit them uh, rather than change themselves if, if they can. Um, somebody pointed out the amoeba uh, faced with a shortage of water, um, shrivels up into a little lump of jelly, and if the water comes back in time, they can rehydrate. Uh, human beings, on the other hand, change the environment. They dig wells, and they build dams, they develop water systems, and so on. I hope that gives you an idea. In the university world, which I may talk about later, Oxford and Cambridge and the like, uh, change few courses on a yearly basis and have the public schools, which means private schools, confusingly, and the, and the top grammar schools to send their best pupils, and they carry on that way. <coughs> At the bottom are organizations that, um, and bottom isn't a pejorative term, hopefully, you know, change half their courses every year. They tend to be trade-oriented, the latest things in engineering, hairdressing, car maintenance, whatever it may be. Uh, and in the middle of <coughs> excuse me, <a> one <coughs> one's <coughs> like Lancaster, they change a small proportion of their courses but have the mechanisms in place to do so fairly quickly. <coughs> the thing about Oxford and Cambridge and the like is if they if they ever do get into difficulty and there's no reason to think they would, they don't have the mechanisms in place to um introduce new courses quickly, so it's a bit like snakes and ladders. They go right down to um, <clears throat> to reactive, not that it's particularly likely to happen. So I hope that ho helps uh, think about what the benefits are. We have two ways of um, <clears throat> uh, describing the learning. One, one is this one here, which is a model. I don't know when it, whether any of you are uh, aware of the core learning cycle. It's quite famous in human resource development terms. Um, uh, uh, if you are, that, that, that's the bottom one, ideas and action, which is a figure eight. Um, uh, the goal learning cycle is that like twisted, um, and as individual learning, the top 
one policy and operations name being policy in the strategy sense, not the rule book sense, uh, is where uh, the policy idea is used to inform operations, hopefully on a pilot basis. It works or it doesn't work and it gets modified when you go around that loop. Um, and the vertical eight on the left is where um, senior managers and leaders consult downwards over a new policy idea. I think it's, there's a book called The Machine That Changed the World uh, about motor cars, uh, Honda and the like, uh, consult the people who are building the exhaust systems and so on um, uh, and, and act according. Whereas I think General Motors uh, developing a new model back at this time, and this is probably a decade or two ago, um, would have a separate team developing a new model, building a pilot plant, running test batches through it, and modifying it and, until it worked, which um, is a slower and uh, probably more expensive way of doing it. Uh, and then the right hand loop is operations and action. Uh, the, the kind of the policy strategy direction is set, but how to do it uh, is up for question. So in the learning organization, uh, an operational plan is tried out, see if it works, modified if it doesn't. And if, and if um, that doesn't work, it um, has to go right back to policy and that would be double loop learning in Chris Ardris's terms, if anybody knows that um, uh, useful set of ideas. Um, oops, sorry, I hope that's, I don't know that's showing for you, it's not supposed to be. Um, and you can imagine uh, organizations getting blockages at, on any point in that. I don't know if you can see my cursor. So for example, uh, some organizations may brief people downwards, but not really listen upwards, so there's a blockage there. Uh, similar thing can happen there and so on and so forth. Or you can get grand policy statements that just stay as that, a boardroom debate, but don't sort of um, translate into action and so on. So individuals learn, but they learn in, within the constraints of uh, both the policy and direction they're working to and the directional constraints from their operational managers. So that's briefly how that works. And um, as I may say more later, you can use this as a diagnostic framework. For example, I've had people physically in a room sort of standing where they think they're mainly engaged and talking to each other about where the problems and issues are in their interaction in, in these terms. Uh, so there, there you have it. Hope that makes sense to you. Do ask questions about it later if you have any problems with that. And then next we have a list of, um, uh, of practices or characteristics so which I'll go through briefly. I'll hope you'll see the relation with um, the previous model which we call the eFlow model. Um, so a learning approach to strategy is that that top loop. So for example, um, if somebody has a policy idea, rather than roll it out for everybody, they try it out on a pilot basis. So there's um, um, a home um, home decorating maintenance store in, in the UK called uh, B&Q. Uh, and they, at the time when there was a labor shortage, they thought we could do more with older workers. Uh, but rather than just do that, they tried it with some um, small handful of stores. Uh, um, recruiting largely older workers, uh, they found it largely worked and also there was an unexpected benefit in which wastage or pilferage, that means um, uh, stock was being stolen by the staff, went down. And there are two theories to why, why this happened, either the people, older people aren't strong enough to carry it out or they come from a more honest generation. Uh, it doesn't actually matter but as, in the light of that they um, put older people in um, in uh, um, key roles like in charge of the stores and so on. Um, Participant policy mating is the eight on the left of the previous model, the extent to which organizations don't just um, brief downwards but listen upwards as in my Honda versus um, General Motors example as a few years ago. Informating is particularly relevant in the IT age, that's where you make the organizations are at least internally transparent so people can consult with each other, dig into shared databases, 
you know, with due regard to confidentiality and so on, and, and generally speed up, uh, make, make organizations more democratic and speed up dis useful decision-making processes. Formative accounting and control, and this is an example of where learning organization isn't just a soft HR human issue, that's where um, the accounting system, which is traditionally um, geared to reporting uh, profit and loss and um, accounts at the end of the financial year, is also used to um, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> make decisions as, as time goes along. If you think of the game of cricket, which I hope you know, uh, <coughs> you, you can write up the score, the scores of a cricket sleep runs and, and um, wickets for each side at the end of the game, which is fair enough, needs to be done. But the bats, the batsmen, all the players can look at the scoreboard uh, while it's going up, while the game is in progress, and think that either they're ahead, and if they um, can just not not survive, they can play more defensively. Whereas if they're um, if they're in difficulty, they might say we'll either you know we we'll, must we'll, we'll go all out for um, for sixes. Uh, so we either make a lot of sixes or we or we get out, but that's the best strategy in that that situation. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I have various examples. Perhaps I'll come back to those um, a bit later. Well, I won't. One one was um, a paper making firm near me in um, Lancashire and Cumbria. Those are counties towards the north of England. Um, they had um, machines that turned out paper, and at the end of the month they got a printout. And said how many of the batches were on time, on target, on quality, <clears throat> um, which was fine to a degree. But they re they replaced that, but with machines above, sorry, with dials and gauges above the machine that showed those things as it went along. <clears throat> and the operators say it's like playing a computer game. You can optimize the machine uh, while it's running, while it's processing a batch of information. Um, Internal exchanges again the kind of more the flows on the the previous model, the extent to which um, <coughs> um, operational people talk to more strategic people and across the functions. So we, you're probably familiar with the term smokestack organisations, where the you know operations, finance, human resources, um, so on are in different different um, hierarchies and don't in, interact as much as they could and should for the benefit of the organization as a whole. So this is what um, overcomes that. Um, developmental reward strategy is a particularly interesting one, <coughs> um, and often the most difficult but possibly most important one. Um, <coughs> uh, this depends on whether the reward strategy um, rewards and encourages collective learning. So for a lot of highly individualized uh, performance related pay systems, if anything, uh, that motivates people who find a smarter way of doing their job to keep keep keep, keep quiet about it um, uh, so they can keep the advantage as long as possible. Um, whereas if you have a more collective form of reward, so for example, the John Lewis uh, a company in, in this country which is very successful also owns Waitrose, the kind of top top uh, food retailer. Um, it's, it's literally a partnership and um, every member of staff gets a bonus uh, at the end of the year um, based on the um, profits and surplus of the organization as a whole and often that comes to about 10% of their salaries. And they also have a much less of a gap between the most junior and the most senior managers in, in pay terms. There are other examples or different ways of doing it, um, perhaps more later. <coughs> um, enabling structures are things that make, make this all happen, so they, <coughs> they can be physical. So for example, um, I went to the Hewlett Packard Research Laboratories near Bristol in the southwest of England a number of years ago, and there they have computer people sitting in little boxes around the building, <coughs> but a kind of collective area in the middle with free tea and coffee and so on, where people can meet and, and talk shop, so that would be a, a physical one. So obviously, they can be um, uh, IT-based as well, a kind of internal 
uh, intranet and so on, which obviously works better with organizations that are geographically um, dispersed. Environmental scanning by boundary workers is um, <coughs> how you find about what your customers and perhaps other stakeholders, uh, <coughs> suppliers and so on are up to and want. So, um, <coughs> for example, um, there's a, a, a bread company called War Warburton's, which is quite successful, based in the north west of England, but covering the whole country. <coughs> and um, at one stage, they were paying a fortune to market researchers to go around to the small shops that sold their bread to see what was going on, whereas they could have, and I think ultimately did, <coughs> um, ask their own delivery van drivers um, to ask, and they would the shopkeepers would tell them what was selling well and what was selling badly and what their customers liked and didn't like and wanted. And when the um, van delivery drivers got back to base, they could be uh, debriefed. So that's both more efficient, probably job enriching for the um, delivery drivers and more economical than doing market research. Um, Intercompany learning is, um, for example, I talked earlier about organizations in a supply chain. They can learn from each other up, up and down. <coughs> um, uh, ask me more about that later if, if you like. Uh, a developmental culture is a more soft one. So um, a developmental culture is one in which uh, you may know this frame is more kind of if something goes wrong, there's less blame and punish and more solve and learn. Um, so, for example, a number of years ago, Ford in this company, country, when they had a, you know, something went serious wrong, or, you know, a model launch didn't work or something, <clears throat> they would have a, an amnesty, so anybody can come forward, and, and even if it was partly their fault, that they wouldn't be punished for it, but they could share what had gone wrong and um, discuss what to do about it. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I guess I have a number of other examples. British Rail, when it existed in this country, we had a West Coast train line. There was a hell of a tilting train which never worked. Um, and the engineers uh, <coughs> knew, knew that it wasn't going to work, but the operational people got as far as um, painting the platforms to mark out the carriages on the new lines, and it wasn't until fairly late in the day uh, that it surfaced that it wouldn't work, and I was working with them on the time on something else. And I happened to mention it, and there was a kind of total silence. It was like something embarrassing in the, had happened in the company. So obviously, if you can't talk about it, you can't learn, learn from it. So that's a developmental culture. <clears throat> and, that, and then lastly on this list is self-development for all, which is that uh, vertical horizontal eight on the previous model. I'll just show it to you briefly again. The ideas and, and action interchange within the constraints of of operation policy, um, so people can can learn. So, for example, I think it was Hewlett Packard again had learning resource centres, and anybody could go to it uh, um, and think of a job that they wanted to be moved or promoted into, think what they needed to learn, and get a largely online or blended learning resource to do it. So, um, <coughs> that, those are the characteristics, and we have a questionnaire based on this, it's best used with what you might call a horizontal slice of the organization, senior managers, junior managers, and across the functions. And that, that gives you a reading of, of how you use it. And, and um, um, uh, sorry, they, they rate how it is and how they think it should be. And that provides a diagnosis. Um, uh, it's quite often the case that uh, developmental reward structures comes out as the biggest gap, but it also tends to be one of the most difficult ones to change. But then in the light of that, you can design an initiative and attempt to um, do something about it. So perhaps that's a slightly less abstract and more operational way of thinking about it. Um, what's happened here? Um, I have some case examples. Uh, uh, Dimensions is um, a charity, it's a quite small one, you know, about, about uh, two or three dozen people, and we managed to get them in the room and uh, do the exercise I talked about earlier, amongst other things, of standing where they were on the flow model 
and discussing what needed to be done and we also did the diagnosis. <coughs> Volvo was a, an interesting one and quite a big one for me. That's Volvo as a whole which um, involved the time cars, trucks, uh, marine which was Penta and one or two other small ones and the HR director's vision at the time <coughs> was to get learning both within and across those uh, and we, we had and it was quite a big um, a big project and we can flew all around Europe at, at least. Uh, it was interestingly run by a marketing person rather than an HR person. Um, but we were, we were well into the project when um, it turned out that uh, Volvo decided to sell the car division. I think it was to it was to Ford at the time. I think it's moved on since then. That had happened behind the scenes. <clears throat> but in, in the process, and it was happening to a lot of um, car firms of that scale, <clears throat> but in the process we took them to um, what was East Germany and took them to the then newish um, Skoda factory in what was Eastern Europe which was owned by Volkswagen <clears throat> and they had a sta state of the art new factory and the Volvo people looked at it and realized that they were in the dark ages in terms of um, car production compared with what uh, <clears throat> what Skoda was, and Skoda had the image at the time of being a kind of rust bucket um, uh, manufacturer. There were jokes about it, like if you fill the tank, fill the Skoda with a tank of petrol, you doubled its value, and things like that. Uh, but I think that made them realise that uh, Volvo car division couldn't um, uh, survive uh, on the scale that it was, uh, because you just have to be so big to get the kind of investment that. Um, Volvo and Toyota and the like can uh, can sustain, so they sold it off, and that to some extent the project um, collapsed. But in another sense, it hopefully it made made a contribution. Um, universities, which I've I've mentioned, uh, <coughs> are interesting cases. Although they're in the learning business, you can't take it for granted that they're learning organisations themselves. Um, they all tend to uh, to survive and do quite well. I think few, if any deliberately try to be so if you go back to the um, two by two in one of my early slides uh, <clears throat> but as I say Oxbridge is probably Oxford and Cambridge that is and uh, 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 is probably generative in other words they change the environment to suit them um, they're attempting now to accept more more diversity because they stand accused of only taking posh public school boys and girls they're trying to do something about that, <clears throat> whereas the other end, um, there are some that are highly, highly adaptive and, and do well out of that, uh, and and so on and so forth. Um, so there we have it for case examples, which we can come back to if you wish. Um, <clears throat> so how to diagnose um, involves using the 11 characteristics questionnaire, which we have, um, and we have norms for it, and scoring systems. And it can be done paper-based or um, electronically via an online survey of some kind. <clears throat> and that's probably the easiest way to do and the most practical. And you can think because all of those um, 11 characteristics sort of interact, they're a bit like a, a chain. Um, and if you think of a chain at any point in time, one of the um, links is going to be the weakest and that's the one that's most worth strengthening it. But when you do, one of the other ones becomes the weakest, but you can uh, chart a course uh, in that kind of kind of way. Um, so you decide which areas make uh, the biggest difference, go for that and carry on and you can evaluate it both by um, um, <coughs> repeating the diagnostic, but perhaps taking measures to further out in terms of performance. And perhaps my mention at this stage, there is some, but not little and not enough evidence that the organizations organisations work. But there's, um, in this country, there was a study of, um, I think they were quantity surveyors. Those are these small practices. Um, and there was a correlation between how highly they were worked, rated in a peer review way, and their scores on the 11 characteristics questionnaire. So there is some evidence that it would be good if there was more. Um, uh, so there, there we have it. Um, uh, if you wish to um, 
take this further, I can put a variety of materials, including the diagnostic questionnaires in this presentation and various other things. Uh, into, I don't know if you know Dropbox, it's one of these cloud-based things, but I can join you to it if you send me your email to my email there. Um, you can open it up with instructions, which is good if you obey, because if you, if you access the files in there in the wrong way, you take them out so nobody else can use it. But roughly speaking, if you open them and save them rather than drag and drag and drop, you will leave them intact, and you're welcome to uh, uh, to, to those. Um, beyond that, you can email me, and I can tell you how I can help you and what the offer is, and we can discuss it from there. Um, I'll I'll um, I'll leave those. Sorry, I'll leave those uh, there for at least two months. So if there's anything in there that you want, do um, copy it onto your own hard drive. Um, but I'll keep it there for at least um, two months. And as I say, you can email me with any questions or issues. Um, there we are. I've um, got through it, through it in just a bit less than half an hour, I make it. Um, but I hope that the benefit of that is it leaves us more time for discussion. So. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor John, uh, for a very interesting presentation, folks. We are now open for question and answers. So if you have any questions, you could either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There's a hand icon available, so please click on it and you will be able to speak or talk directly with Professor John. The first question, um, let me read it over. What evidence is there that it works? Professor. Uh, yeah, well, that is a very good question, um, and I did briefly address that before. Uh, th there is the example of um, the quantity surveyors, as I mentioned. Um, I seem to have lost my screen with you. Um, I don't know what uh, I do. You, anyway. You just click on the blue flower icon in the system tray at the bottom. Yeah, just click on it. Uh, this is your webinar console, and then you click on your PowerPoint presentation. Is that what you're trying to read, right? I want whatever, whatever, um, whatever is best for me to do at this stage. No, don't worry about it. Um, yeah. As I say, there is the example of the um, um, <clears throat> quantity surveyors. I mean, many other organizations seem to take it seriously and may have done internal evaluations that I don't know about, um, uh, but it's a good question and the, uh, <clears throat> there are some answers but not as many as I uh, would like to be. If anybody wants to sponsor me to do some research on that issue, I would be, I, I suppose one issue is I mean, you can do so much with any particular organization, uh, but you get a lot further if you can have a largest sample of organizations, which would be good. Um, are there any more aspects of that question that I could usefully address? Uh, yes, sir. And then there is um, one, what form of leadership and management helps a learning organization? Oh, that, that's a good one. Um, so if you think back to particularly the eFlow model, um, uh, the, the trick, I mean, there is a kind of a misapprehension that um, um, learning organizations are ultra-democratic and non-hierarchical. That, that isn't the case. I mean, hierarchy can be good from this point of view if it operates pro pro properly because senior managers uh, can have the, um, the bird's eye view of the whole situation and make good strategic choices. Uh, but they need, to, they need to have accurate information. So if you look at the left-hand um, figure eight loop between policy and ideas and the rest of it, um, uh, strategic leaders need to communicate down, which they often do, but they also need to listen upwards, and that's where the weakness often lies. Uh, and it may be because they don't think to do it or don't value it or think they know better anyway, but it may be because um, the information gets uh, distorted on the way up, uh, and so they get an inaccurate picture. So, for example, in the British Broadcasting Corporation a number of years ago, 
there were some um, focus groups at operational level which uh, found some quite serious things like, like bullying and so on, but it got filtered up, up the organization um, and by the time it got to the controllers, which is their equivalent of a board of directors, the message was everything's pretty good but the chips in the canteen are a bit soggy. So if that's the kind of information they're getting, they're not getting. So uh, the leadership style and senior management style for a learning organization is one that listens and encourages listening upwards as well as um, <clears throat> briefing downwards and does whatever they can to develop the degree of trust um, that would allow people to tell them. So for example, when I talked about um, uh, was it participatory policy making, uh, if, if like Ford you can have a no-blame inquiry in serious cases, you're more likely to get um, accurate information up, whereas in the British Red example, uh, when things go went wrong at that stage, um, uh, it, it, it didn't um, it, it didn't work. As many of you may know, British Rail is no more. It's been sort of privatised and split up. But I met my client. I was doing evaluation work, and I said, "Well, that it didn't work." And he said, "Well, in, in in part that's true, but some of the people who were on those programmes um, have, have bought up or taken over bits of the organisation." Uh, and are now sort of millionaires in their own right. So, for example, one had, had bought up all the um, those containers that go on the back of lorries and trains, and they sit in an office near Euston, North London, and rent them back to various people, and and, and make a fortune. So, um, that's the, so there was certainly individual learning. There was learning for their new small organisation, but it wasn't hadn't been to the collective good as. British Rail as it as it was. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the leadership style. It can be delivered in very different ways. It can be, for example, in, in this country we have um, uh, Alan Sugar of Amstrad and um, uh, Richard Branson of Virgin and they're both sort of individual heroic leaders, but Richard Branson in particular is often seen in the media, you know, out there with his um, with his staff, whether it's um, rail or banking or uh, the airline industry, uh, um, whereas some um, organisations like Unilever, which I mentioned earlier, I'm, a lot of people in this country uh, couldn't name, including me, couldn't name their chief executive because they have a much more collective style. They have a board that makes some um, distributed leadership decisions in their own right, and they perhaps appoint a new CEO every six or seven or eight years, but it, it works well for them. So there are very different styles of doing it, but the important element is that there's the listening up as to accurate information as well as the briefing and directing down. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile, for delivering this live webinar on this platform. So thank you very much, sir. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure having the opportunity to talk to me. I do hope that some of you follow this up. As soon as I get an email inquiry, I will set up the um, uh, <coughs> Dropbox file and um, take your guidance as to what I'll put some general material in, but anything. If you have any specific wants, needs, or interests, I will see what I can find to, to tailor it to that. And I very much hope we can continue to interact in some way. And I hope you found this interesting and uh, in, enough so to try out some of these ideas. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much uh, once again, Professor, for the valuable time. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording it. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to access the complete knowledge depository of my community. Thank you very much. I'm going to end this webinar. You all will